Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the founder and CEO at Product School. And today I'm here with Samit Arora, who's the Chief Development Officer at TopSpot. Hey Samit. Hello Carlos and hello everyone. So good to be here with you, Carlos, today. Thanks for joining the show. So Sumit is a long time, he was a long time executive at Cisco. You were there for a, for a long period of time and then you joined ThoughtSpot. So why don't you give us a little bit more of background around like how you broke into tech, how you grew to become an executive and then tell us more about what you do today. Sure, absolutely. I think uh, Carlos, uh, my journey, as you correctly pointed out, I spent quite a lot of time at uh, Cisco and that was a beautiful journey. I started off as an engineer. I would say that was pretty much my first main job after school, after engineering school, which I did in India. And um, at Cisco, uh, it was a great career. Uh, grew to be from an engineer to be a business leader, you know, running a multi-billion dollar business focused on service provider networking. Uh, we built a lot of great things, right? Great teams. Uh, great products uh, that form the backbone of the internet, a great culture, built businesses around them. But maybe what is a little different about me in that journey is um, that uh, I changed domains. So I moved after spending two decades in networking and, you know, being almost like an industry leader there, I moved to uh, ThoughtSpot, which is a domain uh, change, right? And not many people do that. Uh, so I refused to remain comfortable and continue and chose to join this uh, domain of data and analytics with uh, ThoughtSpot. So that's a little bit of my journey there, uh, Carlos. So I need to ask you this because you were an SVP and a GM at Cisco, which is a huge deal. So what did they tell you at ThoughtSpot for you to then switch domains and pretty much join a startup? Yeah, so I think um, both, right? What they tell you and what you want, right? It's a combination. Uh, I think uh, the thing I really uh, liked about ThoughtSpot is uh, the team and the talent. But the thing that I always focus on is the mindset. And uh, I noticed very quickly through interactions with the ThoughtSpot team that the team has a growth mindset, people with a growth mindset. So if think of it from my perspective, if I am making a domain change uh, obviously i'll bring some skills but i also have a lot of lot to learn and i was looking to be with people who have this mindset that believes that people can learn and you know transition domains and can do very well in a new domain so this growth mindset was the big deal of course there are other things like being a unicorn uh, you know trying to solve a difficult problem uh, so thought spot uh, you know the people and the team were the first uh, attraction, uh, Carlos. But there's a lot more I can talk about there. So. Yeah, let, let's go a little bit deeper because um, you mentioned ThoughtSpot is now a unicorn. But for still, for some people who don't know about it, can you tell us a bit more about the company today and what's the problem that they're trying to solve? Yeah, I would love to. So uh, ThoughtSpot is in the domain of data and analytics, like I said. Um, the big mission statement for ThoughtSpot is to help create a more fact-driven world. And we, we want to do that by enabling every knowledge worker to have access to insights. Now, Carlos, the big problem statement is that almost every analytics product that has been built so far has been built with a focus on the analyst. And that's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. But what is different about ThoughtSpot is we built the product uh, as a powerful tool for the analyst, but with a much, much wider aperture. The aperture being your knowledge, uh, common knowledge worker, right? Anyone, anywhere should be able to access insights from that companies, that corporations, that value chains data in simple ways. So simple, smart and actionable analytics for everyone. And that is not an easy problem, right? Because it ties directly to adoption of analytics and that culture in an organization. So that's the big problem statement that ThoughtSpot uh, began with. And I agree with you that analytics used to be for analysts or for data people. And it seemed like you had to have a technical degree or a lot of experience in order to really ask some questions to your database. Now we're going through a transformation where regardless of your background, your role in the company, it's okay to get access to information. And hopefully you can 
consult this database in an organic language. You don't even need CQL in some cases. But that's just give me a more tangible example. Let's say I'm a product manager, like a lot of people in the audience, without strong technical background, and they just want to check something related to their website traffic. How can they go about that? Yeah. I know you asked me a specific question on the website traffic, but you asked me about the product manager. So I'm going to give you a two-part answer uh, there, Carlos. First, uh, if you are a product manager, you are building a product. And if you are building a product, and let's say that uh, you know a lot of product managers today, the, the product is delivered through an application. So think about your users and your users who are using that application. So the first uh, thing I want to mention, Carlos, is the concept of ThoughtSpot, uh, the mission, actually extends to this world of the application that is being built. If you embed ThoughtSpot into your application, you are essentially also including your application's users in that ecosystem of knowledge workers who can easily then, in a smart, simple, and actionable fashion, access insights about your app, about their usage, whatever it is that you want to do to engage uh, people. Now, your specific question, which is, you've built this app, you have website traffic, you want to analyze it, right? Uh, the way ThoughtSpot, uh, with ThoughtSpot, what you can do is you can actually analyze literally all the clickstream data. For example, everything that a user came and did on this app, you can collect that and then analyze it with ThoughtSpot. And ThoughtSpot can actually uh, help you maybe, you know, for example, you could find out how many people visited the pricing page and then ended up buying versus how many people actually visited only the home page. So your what we call as customer journey analytics or user journey analytics. As people came to your website, what did they do? What was their journey and where were they most likely to end up buying your product from, through which journey? And then you can optimize, you can apply growth techniques to really optimize that journey to do that. And for doing that, you don't need to write hundreds of lines of SQL. With ThoughtSpot, it's like search. It's like a search engine. Uh, it's uh, as easy as a simple keyword search and maybe a three keyword or a five keyword search uh, Carlos, in most cases, replaces hundreds of lines of SQL. And it's at your fingertips. You ask uh, a question through search. You get the answer. You get the next question. When you look at that answer, you have the next question. So you ask the next question again through search. And it's, it's very simple. It's really uh, a natural language-like. And uh, there is no limit to your curiosity. You can drill down. You can go all the way down. There is no limits to what you can ask. And every person can ask. Every product manager can ask. You don't need any SQL background. I think that is the, the key for a lot of PMs. The fact that you can ask in simple terms. It's a huge trend in product called no code. It's about really empowering creators to just build something without having to understand exactly the little details. So having those type of visual interfaces are empowering a lot of more people, creators, users, customers, to understand what's going on and then use that to make the next move. Absolutely. Well said. So I noticed your title is Chief Development Officer, which is really interesting. We've hosted a lot of Chief Product Officers, VPs of Product, CEOs. You are officially the first Chief Development Officer on the Product Podcast. What does that mean? Yeah, that's a question that comes up, uh, Carlos. And it's actually something that is now beginning to happen more. Uh, uh, so functionally, a chief development officer uh, has in, uh, engineering and product management typically uh, in their function. In ThoughtSpot, we have integrated engineering, product management, and information security together as functions. Uh, uh, the idea is to uh, make sure that we have close, uh, close linkages between these functions and we are uh, you know, reducing uh, execution impedance. But the big, the big leadership role here, uh, Carlos, is about actually creating a product development system or engine, as I call it, uh, a software engine or uh, a product engine, where the best ideas, the most creative ideas, whether they come from our customers or from our employees, they are able to go from idea to value created for our customers in the fastest possible time and with highest productivity. So how do you create such an engine, such a system, such an organization 
where these best ideas can get selected and move forward. So that's kind of job number one. And then the other uh, angle with the CDO role, which is uh, uh, why it is built that way, it's about scale. How are you able to scale a company uh, to multiple product lines? And then the role of the chief development officer is to invest wisely and really empower leaders to grow their businesses and scale them. And these could be multiple businesses. So that's generally what we do here. So in terms of the team that is part of um, chief development officer, is there any, how many people report to you and what are their roles? Yeah, so we, uh, uh, the, the, the size of the team depends on the company in my, uh, in my company, obviously engineering, product management, InfoSec. So you can, uh, if you look at the people, uh, there are, um, uh, there is engineering function, there is product, head of product management, there is product line leader. So we have three product lines at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot, our ThoughtSpot everywhere, which is our embedded analytics for app developers. And then uh, our uh, uh, functionality for operational analytics, which is about taking analytics from analytics systems and actually moving them back to your applications where the users are. So these three product line leaders are also part of this organization. And then of course, there is the InfoSec team, which is a critical, critical part of any company. Got it. So you, you see this role in as a, as a peer to the CTO and the CPO? Uh, the CPO role, in, in this case, the chief product officer role is actually part of the CDO organization. That's how it is structured. Yeah. Okay. So that, That's really cool. Like I'm learning and, and it's so incredible to see how these product organizations have evolved because back in the day, the product team was one product manager. <laughs> and now we're seeing how there are so many more flavors to it. And there's not just one single, one size, one fit, one size fit all solution. It, depending on how the organization evolves, you can create your own product organization. Correct, correct. So how has that evolved for you compared to your experience building products at Cisco and now building products at ThoughtSpot? Is there any specific like high level methodologies or things that you think that are different today? Oh, yeah. I mean, the whole world is uh, changing. And I think, Carlos, I'll, you know, you and I were chatting before we came here. And uh, like you said, we are all learning and growing together. So I'll just share what's uh, going on. Uh, at ThoughtSpot, clearly, uh, the big change for us over the last couple of years has been the power of the cloud. As data has moved more and more and is moving more and more to the cloud. We are also, uh, 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 you know, evolving as a SaaS company, as a cloud company, cloud-first company. And how you build products in in a cloud-first world is is very different. And um, uh, for us, what that means is, uh, if I were to kind of look at uh, describe it in three bullet points, I would say the following: one is the concept phase of a product you know, where you do a product hypothesis and you validate that has become a lot more democratic. You know, you, you have to get the best ideas from everyone. In our hackathons at ThoughtSpot, we have almost everybody participating and it's just flowing with ideas, right? And you have to do that, right? So the concept phase has become very democratic. Second is the phase from concept to development to deployment that loop between the developer and the user is fully connected and it's like a high velocity closed loop now, right? That was not the case in the past. In the past, your concept to when uh, a user used your product could be quarters, could be years. That's no longer true. Uh, you are able to do this very fast and you're also able to get feedback, which was very difficult to get in the past. So that's the second thing that has happened. And the third thing that has happened is this constant ability to digitize the entire experience of the product itself. So whether, you know, from all the way from the developer to the user, the entire pipeline is fully measured, instrumented, measured. You can get the uh, metrics, you can get telemetry, you can learn from it, and you iterate your way to uh, your North Star product objective. And this entire technique has really evolved in the last few years. And it's very different for us. For me, coming from a very different background to here absolutely has been a huge change. So let's say we're all in the cloud right now. We understand that everything is more about 
recurring subscription products and less so about just buying something and, and keeping it in-house. What is that next frontier in terms of product management? What do you think it's uh, well, some of those my major trends that are going to change everything again the same way cloud did? Yeah. So I think um, one thing that uh, is very um, different that we are seeing, and I, I'll probably say this more from an enterprise software company background. Uh, it's more common in the consumer world. But one thing that is absolutely taking more root now, and I think every product manager should uh, take this to heart. So of course, uh, building products in the cloud, uh, like you said, that's a given. But the second piece is even in the B2B environment, because at the end of the day, when you are building a product for other enterprises, whether they use your product for their employees or they put your product inside of their app uh, with our ThoughtSpot Everywhere product, uh, there is a user or a consumer at the back of that. And the focus on that consumer or user is so important. So one of the things we have invested, and I think it's a little uh, unique for us, uh, is we have invested in a growth team, which is different. It's not normal for an enterprise company. It's very normal for a consumer-focused company. And this uh, understanding of growth, which is the ability to look at user journeys uh, and nudge and enable users so that your features are not just being launched, but they are actually landing correctly with users is something that every product manager needs to understand. So um, I think over the next one to two years, I expect this to be like a DNA thing for us. And that's uh, that's kind of my big uh, big focus area as well right now, Carlos. So what I heard when you talk about growth for enterprise team is uh, the adoption of certain features at the enterprise level? Correct. So adoption of the feature at the enterprise level, having a success metric for the feature that, hey, how am I going to measure the success of this feature? And then working backwards from that success metric in terms of what levers do I have to make sure that that success metric happens? And then working backwards from there to make sure you have the right instrumentation and then being able to really, really uh, improve the experience and the outcomes, uh, more importantly, the outcomes as well for your users. So applying these growth techniques, which were more common in the consumer domain, now to the enterprise domain, I think is something that I see as a major thing. And at ThoughtSpot, we do it not just for our mainline product, but we also do it because a lot of product managers, Carlos, are embedding ThoughtSpot into their application using our ThoughtSpot Everywhere product. So we want those application users to also feel very engaged with the analytics that is being served. And that uh, user acquisition, engagement, and retention, we do it through the growth techniques. And that's where our, uh, that's where the big change is. Yeah, go ahead, Carlo. You know, one thing that is part of, of the theme of growth, I've noticed in a lot of enterprise companies is integrations. It's switching the mindset from trying to build every single feature to become the platform, the single source of truth, to being actually you know, more of a, an integrator with other tools where the data flows. So you, instead of having to reinvent the wheel and try to be okay at everything, you try to be the best, but that brings an additional complexity, which is creating a, an easy way to integrate between your tool and many tools, some of them don't even exist yet. So how do you go about that? Great question, great question. Uh, so, you know, some very solid points in your question itself, uh, Carlos. Uh, one is the point you made about uh, complexity and the other is the point you made about leverage right mm -hmm. by integrating especially in the cloud ecosystem by integrating very well with other apps uh, you are creating a much much more valuable solution there is no question and mm -hmm. there is no point uh, building those things mm -hmm. it's better to integrate and leverage so we are all on that but uh, the complexity point is an important one right and at thoughtspot we have this philosophy called less input more output and when I say that, it's for the user. We want the user to be able to do their, get their outcome with the minimal input possible. That's why we, we try to build a very smart system. And uh, so what we do, uh, Carlos, there is we look at the end-to-end -end user journey across these tools and applications, including ThoughtSpot. And our goal number one is how do we make things so intelligent and so auto, we call it auto-magical. 
right? So we we try to look at logs from other tools, look at usage patterns from other tools, and we try to actually pre-do things for the user in such a way that we drive down complexity because removing complexity and making things simple is actually the most difficult thing, Carlos. So that's just one example of how we try to do that. Let's say I'm a CPO and I'm hearing you talk. I'm mean like, okay, this makes sense, but I already have Slack. I have a data warehouse. I have an analytics, a data visualization tool out there. And I'm trying to create this puzzle in my mind to know how can I simplify this whole equation and, and make sure that the different teams that need access to data can do it in real time and the data is consistent. What would you say are some best practices for people to, to get the most out of your tool even before they have your tool? Yeah. So I think, um, uh, look, uh, having clean data, having data governance, security, trust, these are the normal answers. And they are important, absolutely important, Carlos. But I think the number one best practice uh, to be successful with uh, a tool like ThoughtSpot is actually the culture around data that you want to build, right? The best, best practice is what is the culture you desire? You look at any value chain. We are all parts of value chain, right? Any value chain, any value chain today is getting connected and digitized. And a lot of telemetry is beginning to come, right? If your value chain value is delivered through an application, you are more likely a data application than just a software application. So when I talk about culture, what I mean is if you your goal, first goal is, do you want analytics to be like this ether that is available to everyone, wherever they are? If that is the goal, because you want uh, the best decisions to be made by pretty much every person who's involved in that value chain, right? If that is the goal, which I think it is, uh, then the best practice is to first focus on that cultural objective and then choose the tool that really lets you do that. And as far as ThoughtSpot is concerned with ThoughtSpot, we are well connected to the modern SaaS application like Slack and others. We are well connected to the modern data warehouses. Also, we call it as the modern data stack. And we are almost like the analytics operating system in the middle, which is ready for any human, including the analyst, including the business user, including any knowledge worker, to be able to get the most out of this data. And not just get the most out of this data in terms of analyzing it, but also taking action on that data by, because we are connected to these SaaS applications, which are all part of the workflow, so you can trigger the actions there. So yeah, the best practice uh, to be candid, Carlos, is on the culture that you want, which is, you know, spreading the value of analytics to everyone. And I'm actually going through that journey. I I told my team this data culture is is a journey. And when companies start, they don't have the, the resources to invest that heavily into the entire stack. Although that doesn't mean that they shouldn't invest in just understanding data. But it's true that it gets to a point where this becomes much more complex and there are more applications and there are more people and there's more inconsistencies. And, you know, taking those baby steps that allow team members to have some wins along the way, feel it's really important because I've been in projects before where there is no visibility. And you hear stories around, well, we're working on something. And then it's almost scary because you don't know if that new data stack is, is going to remove your job make your job less efficient. And I, I noticed that by involving the team members and allowing them to try and see that, yes, there's something that maybe the machine can't do yet, but maybe we can see how many users visited us last week and how that connects to something else. It's just a, a good way to be part of that culture. Absolutely, absolutely. And you said it right, you know, you, you start, it's like any change management. You start with uh, some people, they're like agents of change and you 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 spread the, the goodness that way absolutely product management in a way it's it's extremely data driven and there was I remember when i started the company there was this misconception around well you have to be a visionary you have to be born a product manager and, and it's not true you can learn it there are some hard skills and, and data is at the middle and of course i agree there is some art to it and intuition and experience that you acquire with time but you can't just rely on that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of data points out there, both quantitative and qualitative, and you can't just miss. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And your point on qualitative is important, uh, Carlos, because a lot of times, yes, data is important and we want it. We want measured. We want uh, to analyze it. But talking to users and collecting the qualitative input and really going behind the need, the symptom to the need, the need is so, so critical in that whole process. So, Samit, I want to use the last uh, minutes of the interview to go back to your own personal story because when you introduced yourself, you were very humble and you said you started as an engineer at Cisco and then you started business uh, as a you got promoted to business manager. So, I just want to understand from your own perspective what are some of those marks of great leadership? What really helped you grow to where you are today? Yeah. So, I think, um, sure, I'll share that. I think, look, leadership is at associated with many attributes uh, people talk about uh, you know being able to provide direction during uncertainty uh, you know inspiring teams around compelling missions so, and those are very very important ones mm -hmm. uh, lately i have been focused on one other aspect of leadership which is to be a multiplier and um, mm -hmm. what that means is how do you kind of be there but not be there right it's almost mm -hmm. like being this oil in an engine, the engine is humming, the oil is there, but kind of people don't look at the oil, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you create a system where uh, a lot of people or all the people in your organization are able to operate at their potential and therefore your organization is, you know, firing on all cylinders, right? And I think that is uh, kind of what I have been really focused on, uh, uh, you know, developing more and more. As a leader, uh, now there is one more angle that I'll share with you, which is important in my journey, and that is the value of persistence. Because when you are trying to create value as a product manager, it's possible and likely that you have to solve a hard problem to create that big value, and it is a hard problem. So you know, hard problems require they don't you don't achieve overnight success. Uh, you know, whether you are building the largest uh, routing or networking systems in the world, or at ThoughtSpot, whether you are trying to really widen the aperture um, and bring every knowledge worker that access to simple, smart, and actionable analytics, right? To do that is not simple, not at all. In fact, at uh, ThoughtSpot, we, our founder says this all the time, we are only 2% done. So it is a tough problem. But persistence that we will make progress, even if it is by inches, and we will never give up. I think that uh, is the other aspect that I look at, uh, besides being that multiplier. So those are my few notes on leadership uh, today. I, I like what you, I like both, uh, especially the, f the first one, multiplier, I'm going to take it for me. The second one, um, I, I use the same, I just call it quick wins, but it's basically that persistence that you are talking about, knowing that you are still a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. So if you Absolutely. were to go back to your be early beginnings and give some advice to that younger Sumit, uh, what would you say? Advice to the younger Sumit? Okay. All right. Maybe uh, just a two-part uh, thing, right? I would stick to the three words that I've always stick, uh, stuck to, which is adapt, learn, and make impact to your organization. So that's a given. But there are two things which I think uh, I would absolutely add to that. One is when you imagine your career, think in terms of a decade. Don't think in the next two, three, four years. I mean, that's okay to think that, but always think a 10-year horizon. It'll help you make better decisions. Think of the skills you want in 10 years, work backwards from that, right? The big skills and work backwards from that. That's an advice I, I wish I had given myself, uh, uh, you know, when I was young. So that's one. Um, and uh, maybe one other, which is absolutely something I have learned more and more, surround yourself with people who have a growth mindset. Because these are the people who will then believe that you can learn, you can do, you can change. And when you have those people around you uh, and you have that willingness to adapt, learn and make impact, you will do well. So that's what I would tell a younger Sumit. Right. Um, thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure to learn from you. Absolutely, Carlos. Really enjoyed it and uh, love to uh, see you in Spain as well. I know you're based in San Francisco, but Spain is beautiful as well. So we'd love to see you sometime. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.